So we're going to talk about different types of models. Now, why are different types of models important? Well, when we are designing a product, we do need to think about how things are represented. Those are called models. And there are different types of models. Right? There's how do we model things? How do we think about things? How do we represent things in code? How do we represent things with a product? How do users really look at those things? And how does it help them understand how a product works? And that's probably the most important part when it comes to user experience, is how does the user understand it compared to what's actually there? And what can we do to improve our products based on what we know about various types of models? So let's talk about, it, about them. First, there's the implementation model. Now, the implementation model is one that you are all very, very familiar with. It's the one that we as technology people have a tendency to focus on the most, because that's the one we're dealing with the most. Because any machine, any digital product, has a mechanism for accomplishing various capabilities, for accomplishing what we are designing it to do for its purpose. That's what we're talking about with an implementation model. It's a representation of how a machine or program actually works. It's also sometimes known as a system model. So here, we're talking about things such as what algorithms are used. Things that we as technology people think about. Right? Not users, we as technology people. What's the coding? What's the architecture of that particular system? It's really all of the details that we have to deal with when we are dealing with technology and building a product, figuring out how to get it to work, making sure that it works correctly so that if there is an error, that is taken care of. Right? So it's the hardware, it's the software, it's the actual coding, it's the algorithms. It's what does this product or system actually contain? Makes perfect sense, right? That's how we all think about it. Except, remember I mentioned there were other types of models? There's also a user mental model. It's also sometimes called a conceptual model. Anyone want to take a guess as to what the user's model is? Right, so it, it does include how the user would interact with it. And what they, you know, what, what they see, I'll take it a little further, what they see in terms of how they perceive it. So when we're talking about the user's mental model, we're talking about how does the user model, visualize, think about that particular product? How do they think it works? Now, do you think most users look at a product and say, ooh, Look at the cool code. I bet I can figure out the code behind this. Yeah, no, unless it's one of us. And we're really super nerdy. I used to do that. I'm not that nerdy anymore. All right, so with users, users, remember, they don't, they don't think like us. They think like users. Think about when I had you pull out your cell phones and find your best friend's phone number. You were thinking like a user does. That's what you need to remember with the user's mental model. So it includes their understanding of the product, how they interact with it. But you want to remember, it does not necessarily reflect how the product actually is implemented, how it actually works. A lot of times, they won't even have an understanding of any of that. It's how does the user understand this particular product. Let's look at a quick example. I want you to think about electricity. All right now, I'm a layperson when it comes to electricity. All right? I'm assuming is almost everyone else here a layperson when it comes to electricity? Okay, so our lay people, when you think of how electricity works, what do you think of? How do you think it works? Um, I go and I plug my computer into the wall. How does my computer get that electricity? 
Yeah, you kind of think of it like water, kind of just like flows in, right? Obviously, that's how it works. Okay, who knows the reality, roughly? I'm sorry? Yeah, you have alternate currents. We call it currents, we still think it kind of, kind of flows. But it really doesn't work that way. It's not like water that kind of just flows up your power cord into your computer. Now, I'll be honest, I don't remember all the details of how it actually works, because it's not that exciting to me. But how it actually does work is very different from how I have a tendency to think about it. So when I have power that is going from the power plant into my house, it's not like I turn a faucet on and water's coming out. It's a very different process. So how I think of it is very different from the reality. Usually I have at least one engineer in here who can tell me how it works, but that's okay. All right, so when we're looking at products, when we're looking at the digital world, which is basically what we are dealing with, we want to remember that how we as technology people think of technology, in other words, the implementation model, and how the user thinks about that same technology or the user mental model is often very, very different. They are quite distinct from each other. One very often has very little to do with the other. Remember that a lot of times users see technology as magic, right? It just works. They don't understand when it doesn't work because it's magic and we are magicians. You know, something goes wrong. Here, it's not working. Fix it. Okay, so um, what's going on? Well, it doesn't work. How helpful. How helpful is that? That's kind of a reflection of the user's mental model. Now, you want to remember this is especially true when we're dealing with software applications and other digital products because that's really even, you might say, behind the scenes even more. So when they hand me their computer, they're not thinking of the application, they're thinking of their computer. <clears throat> now, there's one other model I'm going to talk about. It's called the represented model. Now, the represented model, I will tell you, a lot of times people have the most difficulty with remembering what this model is. It's a lot more obvious what the implementation model is and the user mental model. The represented model is also sometimes called the designer's model. Now, what is that? It's essentially the behavioral face of a software product. So it's how that software product presents itself to the world and how it works. Now, we want to remember, of course, that just as with the implementation model, it tends to be more technology people that develop it, right? It could be a programmer, it could be a, a designer. So it's not the same as a user's mental model. It is a separate kind of model. But it also does not necessarily represent an accurate description of what's going on, as I say, in the code, behind the scenes. It's not exactly as how it is implemented. Let me give you a quick example. I don't remember if I've mentioned this earlier in the semester. Did I give you my example of the uh, database design that I went to go look at with one of my employees once that they showed me an interface? I tell you, okay, look, this is one of my favorite stories. All right, so before I came to FIU, I was a CIO. I don't know if I mentioned that previously. And of course, I had lot, you know, plenty of brilliant technology people working for me because I only hire brilliant people like you guys. Well, there was another organization that was trying to convince our organization to essentially work on a product with them. There was a product that they were already developing. Actually, they had a third party develop it. They were developing it, developing it themselves. And of course, it was a database application. And so they invited us to their offices to come and look at the database. And so I explained to them, okay, you know, I, you know, what I really need to know is I need to, you know, know what the structure is, the constraints, you know, all, you know, all of the really technical details, so I will know whether it fits our data needs. So I actually went with my, uh, let's see, it was with one of my managers that worked for me as well as my DBA. So we go and we sit down, 
And they go and they open up the screen and they show a very, very pretty data entry form. It was very nice. And I'm looking at it, it's like, yeah, you know, it has nice colors. It had the Mac look and everything. And I'm like, okay, great. Let's go look at the database schema. What do you think the response to me was? What do you mean? Okay, you know, you know, I want to see the structure of the database. Let's use that. That's it. Sitting here, I'm like looking at my my uh, cohorts. And they're looking at me, and they're like trying not to laugh. And so I very gently try to explain. Okay, but. See, this is the interface. And it's a very nice interface. You know, it looks you know, easy to use, but I need to be able to understand how the database is structured, what the constraints are on the database, not just the data, you know, the data entry form. And still, what do you think the response was? But that's it, it's right there. It's like, oh yeah, no. So what do you think my response was at that point? Thank you very much, but no thanks, in a very nice way. Now, the scary part was that these were supposed to be IT people showing me this, except I discovered later none of them had an IT degree, by the way. <clears throat> so, big mistake on their part. They, they were, um, I don't, you know, they weren't exactly salespeople. They actually had a, they actually had titles where they were IT customer service people. I can't remember their exact titles. But it ended up that their supervisor had no formal technology background. So he didn't have a good idea of how to find someone who actually knew technology, which was unfortunate. But the point I really want to make with that is even the way they were thinking about it. They're looking at the interface. They thought that was the implementation model. And it wasn't. That was the represented model. So there was not, for example, a one-to-one -one correspondence between what was in that input form and the structure of the database. And you'll find that's very, very common. Does that make sense? Now, why am I talking about these different models? Well, it can make an have an effect on how usable a product is. Because what we want to do is we want to try to make the represented model, <clears throat> excuse me, the represented model as close to the user's mental model as possible. Because it makes the program easier to use and easier to understand. So, we have the implementation model, which is what we deal with, the code, the algorithms, the architecture, data structures. We have the represented model, which is how users actually see what they actually visually see in terms of the product, how the product represents itself. A lot of times this is primarily in the, in, in the interface, not always but primarily in the interface. And then there's the user's mental model, which is how the user thinks about it. So here's my pop quiz question. Actually, this makes a great exam question. Did I include this in my review? I don't remember, but I'll ask you anyway. All right, so based on what I just told you from the three different kinds of models, which models do you want to be most closely aligned in order to have a product that is easier to use? The represented and the user mental model. You want those two to be as close as possible. Now, if you go ahead and try to make the implementation model the same thing as the represented model, what do you think is going to happen? Yeah, it's going to be really difficult for your average user to understand. Because average users don't understand things like databases. They don't understand things like SQL and, and writing SQL code. It's completely foreign to them.
So with our represented models, that is where we want to take our designs and we want to use them in a manner that is going to help us help humans. We want to take something that's very complex and put a much simpler face on it. Because the fact is that we have a tendency to simplify things whenever we can. So it is easier for us to process quickly and understand. Remember when we talked about Gestalt theory? How we have a tendency to want to find patterns and to simplify things. It reduces our cognitive load. Users do that not only with the cute, those cute little pictures we saw, but we do that in general. So if we take our user interfaces and we make them consistent or as consistent as possible with the user mental models, they are going to be vastly superior to an interface that is based on your implementation model. Why? Because it's going to be easier for the user to understand. Now, your author likes to have these axioms. Have we had axioms in the class before? Yes? I kind of like the axioms. To me, they're very, very concise. So let's look at two quick axioms. User interfaces should be based on user mental models rather than implementation models. Now, I've said this, what, about 10 times in the past 15 minutes? So why have I said this 10 times in the past 15 minutes? Because you tend to ignore it. I'll ask the question on, on my midterms and people will get it wrong. And I'm like, wait a minute, I guess I didn't say it enough. And you also want to remember that goal-directed interactions reflect user mental models. Right? Our behavior reflects how we think about things. It's kind of like a little chain. Makes sense, but you really have to put it together and think about it. 